Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Gut Talk series. This is a series which is part of the Microbiome Academy at the Nestle Nutrition Institute. Today, we have the pleasure of having with us Dr. Bernard Berger, a leading expert in the field of microbiome research who works right here at Nestle Research. He's going to talk to us about the infant gut microbiome and the contribution of Nestle research to the overall science in this field. Thank you, Bernard, for joining us today. So Bernard, let's start with um, the first question. Uh, I think the basic is what everybody would, would benefit from learning. So what is the microbiome and what is so special about the gut microbiome in infants? When we talk about the microbiomes, actually, we talk about the communities of bacteria, viruses, and also fungi, uh, which lives on us and within us. Actually, the, the most important community, community is uh, located in our gut. Now, for the infants, there is a beginning, there is a seeding. And uh, at the beginning, at birth, an infant is essentially sterile. Then the bacteria will come from the mother. So from the rectal, actually, uh, part of, of the mother. And to a certain extent, also from the vaginal microbiota. Then you have also the contact with the skin of the mother and the environment. Uh, all these bacteria actually are progressively seeding the microbiome, especially in the case of C-section uh, delivery for skin microbiota and the environment. The, the, the breastfeeding, is also bringing some bacteria. Uh, but here, the, the question is the origin of these bacteria uh, found in the breast milk. It's a little bit less clear in the literature at the moment. So during the first year of life, the rate of establishment of the microbiota is very fast. And actually, it, it may look very chaotic. In fact, it is not. It's not chaotic at all. There is a, a rapid succession of communities and these communities actually are of growing complexity, growing diversity, and they represent a kind of uh, trajectory in the development of the microbiota. Um, we, we observe a, a progressive transition toward the microbiota of infant very early in life towards the, uh, the microbiota observed in, in adults. And this stabilization phase happened between two, three years of age. Um, it's important to consider the, the development of the microbiota as a trajectories or trajectories, plural. In fact, we, sh we should not consider that there is a good or a bad microbiota in infants. There is just the right microbiota at the right moment. And this microbiota supports the development of the immune competences, the metabolic health of the infant. In terms of, of impact on health, um, uh, short term, the microbiome plays a role in the gut comfort of the infant. For example, infant, um, uh, uh, in colicky infants, the microbiota is different. And also, uh, it brings the protection against infections. Mm -hmm. If we consider long term, here, um, if the, the establishment of the microbiome is disturbed, um, uh, then it may increase the risk of obesity, diabetes, mental health disorder, a number of diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, atopy, and so on. Now, of course, there is this long list of diseases. What is the level of evidence? So depending on the disease, it varies quite well, uh, quite a lot. Um, but overall, I would say that the importance of the microbiome in health and disease is, is quite convincing. Uh, Sometimes we even have uh, uh, ideas about the potential mechanism to explain how the microbiota is impacting health. We've heard a lot about the breast milk microbiome in recent times, and we know that this is a hotly debated topic with evolving science. But as an expert in the field, we'd love to hear from you. So can you share with us what that means? What is the breast milk microbiome? And how does the breast milk microbiome may or may not differ from the microbiome of a breastfed baby? So it's a very interesting question. Um, uh, the breast milk is not sterile. There is no doubt about this statement. Now we have two hypotheses for the origin of the bacteria in the human milk. So first is the oral anteromammary pathway. So this is the translocation of both um, maternal oral and maternal gut 
bacteria toward the mammary glands. The second hypothesis is the acquisition of uh, exogenous derived bacteria. And in that case, it is a transfer from the maternal skin and the infant oral uh, bacteria. The literature on, on this topic is quite confusing. The, the problem is that the biomass of bacteria in this milk sample is extremely low. And therefore, this is prone to technical artifacts. However, a recent studies, study um, has shown that feeding mode, and in this study, actually, they compare nursing directly from the breast with nursing using a pump, uh, that this feeding mode was the most consistent factor associated with milk microbiota composition. So this suggests that the exogenous, exogenously derived bacteria have a stronger role in the milk inoculation than the anteromammary pathway. In other words, the breast milk microbiota may essentially come from the maternal skin and the mouth of the infant by retrograde transfer when suckling. So does it mean that the, the human meal microbiota is something which is negligible? I don't think so. In fact, the bifida bacteria, they play an important role in the gut microbiota of infant. And in fact, in this study, they've shown that uh, up to 40% of the breast milk samples were colonized with bifida bacteria. So this means that the milk microbiota may play the role of a reservoir for milk associated bacteria, which are beneficial for the infant. So this is something that, that is important. It will probably be further clarified in the literature. Bernard, oftentimes in uh, clinical practice, healthcare professionals hear the words microbiome and microbiota, and you've used those words in our session today as well. So I'd really like you to take a minute to answer um, this rather fundamental question. Is there a difference, and what is the difference between the microbiota and the microbiome? And, and, and a little bit of your sense of how they're used in common medical and scientific literature. Yeah, so uh, actually I also do the same. We, in practice, microbiome and microbiota are used interchangeably. Mm -hmm. uh, but formally speaking, yes, there, there is a difference. The microbiota is the sum of the organism, the, the living yeah. organisms, uh, whereas the microbiome also includes the metabolites produced by these organisms. So it's a kind of description of the ecosystem. Uh, so the microbiome is the most general term of the two, uh, and it has the advantage to also describe the molecule, the metabolite that interact with the host, with us. So thank you for that. Uh, and I think it's an important clarification for people to realize that while these words are defined differently in, in the literature and in a lot of presentations, they are often used interchangeably. So thank you for that, Bernard. So what, what is really interesting and that healthcare professionals looking at the children oftentimes ask is, so what are the factors that really influence the microbiota of these infants, particularly the gut microbiota of these infants? So I'd love to hear a little bit on what you can share with us and what the science has taught us so far. Yes, so uh, several disruptors of the establishment of the microbiome uh, were identified. So the, the first one, for example, is, is a preterm delivery. So you can understand that with this uh, medical environment, the microbiome will be disturbed. There is also the case of C-section delivery. In that case, you have no rectal feeding from the mother. So it comes pr uh, preferably from the skin of the mother. And uh, you also have the medical environment in that case. Then you have antibiotic treatments. Uh, antibiotics are harmful for common cell microbiota, not just for pathogenic bacteria. And then uh, I would say that the absence of the sh a short period of breastfeeding has also an impact on the microbiota, not bringing a number of molecules like human milk oligosaccharide, mm -hmm. secretory IgA, and, and other molecules that are coming from, from the breast milk. Actually, nutrition is a very important factor shaping the microbiota. And actually, it's, it's also the case in adulthood. It's not just uh, in, in infant. Um, the, in infant, the introduction of solid food 
and the weaning actually both trigger strong changes. And uh, these changes progressively shift the infant microbiota toward the microbiome of infants. Mm. Okay. So that's, that's very interesting. And, you know, I think there's more and more of this data, particularly on antibiotic use influencing the infant gut microbiome, as well as, you know, what is oftentimes common practice and use of acid blocking medications, for example, as well, influencing the microbiome of these infants. So thank you for that. And one of the, one of the often discussed topics is on the geographic variability that occurs. So is the microbiome of an infant in one part of the world different from that of another part of the world? And, and I, as I understand, um, you know, from scientists at Nestle Research, much like yourself, who've been involved in this field for a long time now, I'd love to hear a little bit on what, what are the commonalities, what are the differences, and what, what's the clinical relevance of these findings? Um, it's a great question. I really like this question. <laughs> so some differences uh, have been observed in the microbiota of infants uh, between countries. And for example, in the north of Europe or in the US, it seems that the prevalence of bifidobacteria is significantly lower than in Central Europe or the south of Europe or in Asia, for example. So uh, here you have a first difference at genus level. Then what is interesting is also that among the countries showing a dominance of bifidobacteria, we also observe differences at species and subspecies level. Uh, for example, the, 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 you may have heard about Bifidobacterium longum subspecies mm -hmm. infantis. So this, this subspecies is more prevalent in non-industrialized countries uh, compared to Europe, for example. Um, so the question actually behind is, what does it mean? What is the, the origin and, and what is the impact? So for the origin of this uh, um, geographical variability, we cannot be sure, I mean, it, it's unclear. It requires more investigation with very standardized protocol in order to prevent the methodological biases. Um, uh, because with methodological biases, it may come from the result associated to the different countries. This difference of microbiome may be linked to the long-term effects of sanitation, medication, and I would say overall, what we call the westernization of lifestyle. Looking at the difference of incidence of the non-communicable diseases between these countries, yeah. uh, then these differences of microbiome uh, uh, may play a role, may influence health. And therefore, uh, this merits more attention. We have something to learn here. We are currently conducting an infant court study in uh, Dhaka in collaboration with ICDDR Bangladesh. Uh, this institute is one of the leading research centers for yeah. diarrheal disease. So I think it's here we, we, we have to learn uh, in order to understand why the, uh, the, these differences may play a role in, uh, in the microbiome. Renard, I know you and a lot of the other scientists at Nestle Research have been involved uh, very, very closely in this field. So I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit from you as to the work that's happening at Nestle Research, which is overall informing the science of microbiome and uh, research in this field of the influence of microbiome on health overall. Yeah, Nestle Research has a very long history of research uh, on infant microbiome, uh, starting more than 20 years ago. At that time, the microbiome was studied with very simple techniques like plating, so filtering of bacteria on, on selective media, uh, or fingerprinting, looking at some, uh, the detection of some specific molecules, but not the whole high technology that we have now. So the impressive development of the technology of the last two decades uh, has brought this field of research uh, really under the limelight. And, uh, and, and so this is the reason why we are discussing today. Um, at Nestle Research, we rapidly contributed by publishing the first full genome of the Bifidobacterium, Bifidobacterium longum subspecies longum, and also the second genome of a gut lactobacillus, lactobacillus johnsoni. Um, then we also use this new high throughput technologies to document our preclinical and clinical investigations. 
Uh, in this frame, we developed a collaboration with the Imperial College in London to study the metabolites uh, produced by the gut microbiota in infants. Uh, we had also a collaboration with the Epigen Consortium in Singapore. And with them, we published one of the very first analyses of the gut microbiome establishment in infants up to six months uh, using next generation sequencing. So overall, a portfolio of research allowed the development of probiotics and prebiotic for infant nutrition. And more recently, we also introduced the um, human milk oligosaccharides. So working with clinicians, we conduct clinical trials for infant nutrition, looking at safety and efficacy. And when performing uh, this clinical trial, we do in conjunction the analysis of the microbiome. And uh, these studies actually are providing invaluable material to understand how the nutrition impact the microbiome. And this is important for future development of ingredients. This research uh, uh, resulted in a constant improvement of our infant formula, moving the microbiome of bottle-fed infants closer to the microbiome observed in breastfeeding. And we should not forget that breastfeeding is the gold standard in infant nutrition. Well, thank you for that. It really speaks about sort of the history of FIRST, which we've known Nestle Research to do, as well as the very important point that you mentioned, Bernard, and the collaborations between Nestle Research and reputed institutions, academic and uh, consortiums all over the world, like you mentioned, Imperial College, the Epigen Consortium, as well as the work that's being done with the ICTDR in Bangladesh as well. You know, I know that the science of microbiome continues to evolve. Um, what would you suspect or predict would be the future directions on the infant microbiome research? What should we expect to hear or learn or see more about in the coming few years? So uh, there is a huge amount of missing information uh, to understand what is the, the host microbe uh, interaction and um, especially in infant, I would say, um, uh, and how it impacts on health. So we are still in the infancy of this field of, of research. The real future uh, for microbiome research will be the, the progressive integration of these uh, uh, tools yeah. to the mainstream medical research and, and clinical practices. The challenge will be the application of these new tools from lab bench to bedside, uh, to use this information for the microbiome and, uh, and uh, from the microbiome, sorry, for clinical decision. So in other words, the microbiome has the potential to, to play a role in the development of personalized medicine and personalized nutrition. For example, in the future, microbiome characteristic, microbiome features may be used to indicate whether a subject might respond to medical or dietary intervention or also, uh, uh, it could be used to select which treatment or diet may be best adapted to a person's physiology. So, Bernard, thank you. I think this was, this was a really informative session and really the last answer just gives us a sense of direction um, on how we can use the science to better inform clinical practice in, in the future, both at a broad practice level, as well as at an individual, like you said, a personalized level in the future. So on that note, Bernard, I just want to thank you on behalf of the Nestle Nutrition Institute uh, for this interesting discussion. And uh, for those of you who are watching us today, we'd like to invite you to visit the Microbiome Academy uh, for other videos just like this one, as well as interesting new science, outstanding facts that can better inform you to help the patients that you look after so well. So thank you very much. And we look forward to uh, further conversations with you, Bernard, as the science and the field of microbiome research continues to evolve. Thank you. Thanks.